Now that you've seen what the model looked like at the project start, here we have the model now fully completed. Let me bring the camera in closer so you get a better idea on what was done. Starting with the model's running gear, there's nothing really much to talk about because the suspension was left pretty stock. The units were very nicely done out of the box. What was done, however, was that during the build I went ahead and removed all of the row wheels, including the sprocket and the idler, just so I could get everything thoroughly painted. This also includes the lower hull as well. Once everything was painted and weathered, I went ahead and remounted all of the wheels with the same type of assembly technique which was used originally. The wheels are held onto their swing arms via small little grub fasteners and this same system was utilized. However, when it came time to removal of the wheels, some of the fasteners were stripped out, so new replacement ones were found. Now, the unit utilizes M3 grub fasteners, so acquiring a replacement set wasn't very difficult. These fasteners are found on microfasteners.com, and again, were very easy to track down. Now, during the reassembly, all the fasteners were secured in place with a small little drop of blue Loctite. This is true for all of the main row wheels, as well as the sprocket as well. Now the sprocket has a small little removable hubcap, which gets access to an M3 hex, or I should say a cap screw, which secures the sprocket to the main spindle on the gearbox. This is true for just about all of the 116 scale rear control tanks on the market. Now the wheels and the idler have ball bearings mounted in them to help them roll over the axles. This does greatly help the tank's performance because this allows the model to glide a lot more easily over terrain. Now all of the running gear components from the track to the idler to the sprocket and of course all the running gears are made from die cast metal. This is a detriment and a benefit at the same time. First benefits are that it gives a lot more added weight to the model which does help settle it down and slow it down so that when you're running it it's really reflected in its performance. A detriment is also again the weight. Lugging one of these heavier models around does get a little bit cumbersome after a while but it's something that you could easily learn to live with. I'm not really one to talk too much about that on account I also work on 1.6 scale armor techs which are orders of magnitude heavier than one of these smaller 1.16s over here. But it is something to keep in mind specifically if you're not used to dealing with something of this weight. Now of course this wouldn't be a ECA tank build video if I don't point out on the center portions of all the hubcaps on the real King Tiger series there would be a small little grease or zerk fitting and on these vehicles, they're usually painted in red. Now, the Zerk fittings are molded into the Toro and Tegan tooling, so a little brush of red paint is really all that's needed to really make them pop out, and of course, this does make it a lot more noticeable and does improve the accuracy of the build, as opposed to, of course, leaving it oversprayed. Now, just like with the main row wheel hubs, there's another Zerk fitting found right here on the face of the sprocket. This little bit of detailing is integrally molded on, and you can see just with a little swipe of red paint really helps it pop. Now, the hub itself is removable because this is what conceals the mounting fastener that is beneath. The hub itself is not glued in place with any permanent means and is actually tacked on with a few drops of white glue. I've used silicone on some other builds in the past for the same reasoning and which is you don't want to have any permanent a fixture of this part in case you need to get access to the sprocket fastener. If there's ever anything detrimental that happens, either you break a gearbox or for whatever reason you need to remove the sprocket, if the hub is held on with a permanent type epoxy, it's just going to make your life all that much more difficult in getting access to this location. With the white glue, if the need ever arises, I can simply pry the piece off and get access to the fastener without any damage being done to the sprocket or the hub. Now the fastener is a Allen type cap screw. It's an M3 fastener with a small little black lock washer on it which is very standard for these 116 scale models. The pieces are all stock. The only tip that I recommend is just like with the row wheels a couple drops of blue Loctite are utilized to seat the fastener in place and prevent it from backing out during the model's operation. Obviously this is something you want to keep in a nice secure manner and you don't want any chance of anything getting loose on you. Now from the suspension brings us to the tubular tail light. The unit that we have here like I mentioned before is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com catalog and is 3D printed. This gives you a lot of fine crisp detailing on a piece that's very very small in size. Now on this model here I did patch it into an LED fiber optic system in order to 
have the component glow and light up. Regrettably, however, after some more testing, I was unable to get the pieces successfully light up. This 3D printed material doesn't really have the light reflecting capabilities as some other materials do. Now for this model here, it's not really a big deal for me as I don't really care too much if the tubular tail light doesn't function. However, if someone does really want to have this piece light up, this set here may not necessarily be what you're looking for. Now, the kit originally had this unit molded into the rear deck, or the rear plate here, as integrally molded in piece, but it's very soft on the detailing. In the past, I was able to jury rig a LED operating system, but for this model here, I went ahead with the better detailed approach. From the tubular tail light now brings us to the lower section convoy reflector. This little bit of detailing is found on all of the German tanks of the period in this same location, and the King Tiger series is no different. Now on the Toro or Tegan rendition of the King Tiger, the small little bracket is integrally molded into the rear plate, but the actual reflector detailing is not. The reflector here is supplied with the ECA tubular convoy light set, and you simply just clip it off and mount it to the section over here. Moving from the reflector now brings us to the model's jack. Now the jack detailing as well as the jack mounts are the stock Toro or Tegan units and were simply utilized as is. The only addition that I made was the detailing of the wing nut bolts that we have here. Now the wing nuts themselves are again integrally molded onto the braces as are the little hinge mechanisms but what's absent are the center eyelet stem sections of what would be threaded rods. This detailing was added with simple floor wire. I just cut the pieces and mounted them in place after the jack was fitted. Adding this little bit of detailing finishes off this detail quite well and the piece is then completed. From the jack now brings us to the jack block. The jack block itself again is the stock unit and was basically utilized as is. The only improvement I made is that on the bottom portion here of the jack block there is a small rectangular cutout that is present. I believe this has to do with some kind of a switch design that never was really implemented but it's carried over on these castings. The block itself was plugged up with some sheet styrene and then just blended in with the bodywork. Once everything was painted and mounted, the piece is completely seamless. From the jack block brings us to the exhaust manifold and the manifold covers themselves were basically left as is with the exception of some added cast texturing which was applied giving the piece a little bit more of a realistic look. Now from the covers themselves brings us to the actual exhaust manifolds. These again are the kit units but receive some modifications to them making them a little bit more accurate. First the stock units are a two-piece affair that are bolted together. The bolts were added permanently with also some adhesives and then were blended into the casing of the actual exhaust manifold bottom section which kind of looks like a jar of some sort. Once the fasteners were blended in, cast texturing was added, completing the look. Now another modification made to the exhaust manifold had to do with the back sections. On the stock unit there is a small metal peg which emerges from the exhaust manifold and makes contact with the rear plate. This little peg here is an alignment jig and it keeps everything in index in its proper orientation. Unfortunately this little peg is an eyesore and does detract from the look of the model. On the model here I went ahead and amputated that little piece and then blended in the rear section with the bodywork that I mentioned before. This greatly helps the accuracy of the piece compared to leaving it stock. Now when the exhaust manifolds were reattached good epoxies and adhesives were utilized in order to keep them where they need to be negating the need of the little alignment peg in the first place. Now in addition to removing the alignment peg, bodywork was also done on the rear plate here because obviously there was a small little hole found on this rear plate for the peg to connect to. And on the top sections of the exhaust manifolds, I add the small little blocking bar that we have here. This was done with a small piece of floor wire and of course a Dremel was utilized in order to drill out the locations where the wire needed to go. Needless to say, this detailing is a very crucial one on the King Tiger as it's a staple to its design. Moving from the exhaust manifold brings us to the tank's engine deck and there's not really much to talk about here because it was left basically stock. The Toro 
Engine deck detailing is excellently done with again its photo etch even pre-applied. Now one change that I did make had to do with the machine gun mount and the engine hatch that we have here. Starting with the small little lump that we have here, the King Tiger engine hatch has this small half rounded little section. On the real vehicle this is actually used to put a pry bar in to help aid with opening up the engine hatch which on the real vehicle is quite heavy. On the Toro unit this is molded out of a piece of die cast metal and the piece here is solid. With a Dremel bit I just bored out the unit slightly giving you the hollow appearance which is needed. From the pry bar mount takes us to the machine gun mounting pedestal. Now this unit here is supplied with the stock Toro kit and is a nice little feature to have. Now one modification I made had to do with the fins that are found on this location. On the stock unit these little sections here are represented by three little shark fins that are again integrally molded to the piece. On the real Yag Tiger, the fins are not fins instead they're actually pieces of bent wrought iron that are welded to the bottom plate and then to the main stem. The fins were deleted and in their place three little pieces of floor wire were fabricated and mounted in the locations where the fins were originally. Now as for the gun itself this is again the stock unit that was supplied with the model and was basically utilized as is. The gun itself is a little bit on the more simplistic end compared to some of the other renditions found on other models in 116 scale from the other companies say like Trumpeter or as well as many of the other aftermarket suppliers that are out there but the gun itself is workable in my opinion to give you a basic MG42. One modification I did have to do was that there is a small little sinkhole found on the side here of the receiver and this was present on the last Yak Tiger build as well. The sinkhole was just puttied over and then blended into the rest of the receiver's detailing thus eliminating it. Another modification I did was to the muzzle end. I went ahead and drilled out this section with a small little pin vise giving you the nice detailing which would be found on the machine gun tip. The other detailing to mention is just on the pistol grip and on the buttstock. These units were made from very different materials throughout the war and Red Bakelite was a common material utilized for the MG42 furniture. This is one of those details by the way where if the builder wants to take the model to the next level, replacing this with a aftermarket unit is something I would recommend. Now moving back down to the engine hatch, this is a very important bit of detailing because it needs to be fully functional and it is on the model. The reason why it's important is because under here conceals the model's control panel where it gets access to all of the RC functions. This would include the main power switch, the cutoff for the smoke system, and even the volume control. As well as the way the model comes apart. If you hit this large latch like I mentioned before, you can, you can take the entire top deck off. Now, when it comes to the hatch itself, the inside portion I hit with a shot of red primer and gave it a little bit of weathering. The red primer would be the color that the engine compartment would be painted on these King Tigers. Now, furthermore, in addition to the main power switch setup, I also have here the recharge jack so I could charge the model's batteries without having to get access to the inside. This is a common feature that I do on these 116 builds because once the model is fully built and painted, you really don't want to crack it open constantly just to charge the battery. With this, I can charge the battery without having to open up the model, and once done, I just stuff the wire back in, and the model can proceed with its operation. From the engine hatch now takes to the rear section of the fighting compartment. On this section here we have, we have these two very large armor doors and they are a very convenient location found on this model. Not just for detailing purposes, as they are nicely done, but also to get access into, onto the interior. They are fully functional as per the kit and do have some nice interior detailing on their latches. However, in addition to that, this is also where I like to have the refill system for the smoke fluid. With this little tube here, I can refill the smoke system reservoir without again having to open up the model. This is another feature that I also like to build on these 116s, and like I showcased before, it just patches directly into the smoke system. Once the unit is fully filled up via the little supplied smoke fluid bottle, it gets capped, and this unit here can get stuffed back inside of the fighting compartment. 
without any sweat needing to be exhibited by removing the upper deck. Moving from the fighting compartment doors now takes us to the side section of the actual fighting compartment. Now, like I showcased in the last video, there is a seam which runs along this section over here because the top portion of the fighting compartment is a separate plastic component from the upper hull. When doing the rebuild, I went ahead and permanently attached these two sections together, the adhesives, and then the seam work was completed. With the seam work out of the way, the upper and lower portion of the casemate are, look like to be one continuous unit, which is what you're looking for on one of these Yag Tigers. Of course, this is true for the opposite side as well. This is one of the biggest drawbacks on the Toro model, but once completed and is an easily fixed little gaff to eliminate, one side of the way, the model's accuracy balloons immensely. And it's definitely something I recommend to be done to anyone that wants to bring these models up to the next level. Also added to the fighting compartment are these small little tie-down mounts that we have here along the top leading edge. This is a mirror image on the opposite side and are also found on the rear section here. As well as the front top of the fighting compartment which once in frame you can see how they look now these components here are all fabricated out of small pieces of floor wire which were bent and mounted to the top portion of the casemate and to mount them small holes were drilled into the plastic with the dremel giving a nice strong adhering point also while on the casemate you can see the extra torch cut lines which were enhanced from the stock kit offering. These were added with a small Dremel bit and were added to all of the locations which torch cut lines would be present on the model. Now the model does have some torch cut line detailing there but it's a little bit on the softer side specifically once a few coats of paint and primer get added they can get covered up quite quickly so enhancing these with a Dremel or a needle file is definitely something I recommend for anyone who's again rebuilding one of these Toro Yag Tigers. This is not just true for the casemate but also for the other sections of the puzzle type assembly which are found on the upper hull and lower hull of these Yag Tigers. Moving from the torch cut lines now brings us to the front armored section of the casemate. Now this did receive a bit of modification and work in order to bring it up to the conditions you see in this video. Like what was mentioned and seen in the first unboxing portion of this model there is an LED mounted in this location over here. Now the purpose of this LED is that this is the indicator light for the airsoft firing gun. This LED is present on all of the RTR 116 scale radio controlled models and is definitely usually something that dings the look of the build and is something I, I usually have to contend with. Now on something like a Pershing or a Tiger 1, this LED can be hidden on the inside portion of the mantlet covered up with a bit of detailing either for a coax machine gun or the main gun optic depending on which vehicle I'm referring to. However, on the Yag Tiger that's not going to be the case because Unlike those other vehicles, there is no machine gun mounted on the front of the casemate, nor is there any sort of a vision slit that is present. On the real vehicle, it's literally just a slab of cast steel, which, by the way, in person is quite impressive. Now, on the model here, the LED light was definitely not going to be something I'm going to keep on the exterior, so I went ahead and removed it from this little section and remounted it on the inside portion of the model. You have to have the LED still present on the build, not for any real legal purposes, just for functionality. If you remove the LED system and just connect the two leads, the airsoft firing unit and even in some cases the barrel elevation will no longer continue the function. So just leave the LED only I glued it on the inside with a little bit of hot glue so that it's just tucked in out of the way. Where the LED was emitting from, or I should say emerging from, that section was completely plugged up and blended in with the bodywork. Now luckily on the front portion of the Yang Tiger, this entire front armor plate that we have here is comprised of a single steel casting. So 
adding the texture to it was really easily done and you don't have to spend a whole lot of work with sanding and blending in a little piece for a nice smooth finish because you could just cake over the cast texturing and the piece is thoroughly and utterly deleted like you see here on this model. Now a similar story was also done to the mantlet itself. The mantlet on the Yag Tiger again is a gigantic cast steel component and on the real unit the back section that we have here is still in the rough and the front section here is actually turned and is nice and smooth. This is present on the Toro model in that on the rounded section here there is some texturing that is integrally molded in. The texturing however is a little bit on the bumpy side and doesn't really look like cast texturing. It just has a stepple type appearance to it. On the model here, I went ahead and just added the new cast texturing directly over the stock piece and you get the look that we have here. This is another trick that also greatly helps the look of the model and definitely makes it look a lot better. Now on the front portion here of the mantlet there is a integral lift type bar and on the real unit would be welded to the mantlet. This piece of detailing is found on the stock Toro model and all I did was add a little bit of sculpted weld beads to complete the look. From the mantlet now takes us to the bow hatch area. The hatches are the stock units and are fully functional and we're left basically as is. One little bit of detailing I did add was the conduit cover cap that we have here. The conduit cover cap is integrally molded on the stock taken unit but it's a little bit on the soft side in detailing. That unit was simply just removed entirely and the ECA unit was dropped directly in place. The wire was also supplied with the ECA piece and just bends around to the rear section here of the Bosch light completing its detailing. From the Bosch light conduit now takes us to the bow mg 3014 machine gun. Now the machine gun itself is the stock unit and was left as is and untouched. The unit is nicely designed in that it can pivot left and right and up and down. It does have some nice functionality to it. The piece does have a little piece of fiber optic on the inside and it flashes when the machine gun option is triggered which I'll go over in the driving portion of the, of the video series. The detailing was really focused on the machine gun ball itself. Now the armored ball is integrally molded into the top deck and is smooth in texture on the stock unit. On the real tank however this would be casted and so the cast texturing was added which does help the look of the piece as opposed to leaving it smooth. In addition to the cast texturing, sculpted weld beads were added around completing the look. While on these weld beads, I also added the weld beads here to the to the braces which connect the travel lock to the top deck or I should say to the front armor plate of the vehicle. From the front plate now takes us to the roof of the model. All the detailing you see on here is left stock and really nothing was need to be changed. The stock Toro model does have some very nice detailing found on this plate. The noteworthy things to mention is that of course the main commander's hatch is where the airsoft firing kill switch is and is also the hopper for the airsoft gun. Another bit of detailing that was replaced has to do with the model's antenna base. Now originally the model would have had a German AFE antenna base integrally molded into the top roof. However, I went ahead and amputated that section and replaced it with a new 3D printed German AFV antenna base from EastCoastArmory.com. Now the piece itself is not glued to the model in case I need to transport the model around and I don't want to damage this bit of detailing. The piece is just held in place with friction and if I pluck it out you can see how the piece snaps in. You can also see the detailing found on this part here which is why I replaced it from the stock unit. Just like with all these German AFV antenna bases, the bottom portion here is made from rubber and the top portion here is actually made from a brass or a copper tube and then there's a wing nut that is used to clamp the antenna wire in place. When the model is being displayed or when I want to drive it, I simply just slide this guy right back where he needs to be and I can now operate the model with the detailing present. Moving from the roof now brings us to the model's Pioneer tools and cable work. All of these fittings here are stock with the model and were simply just recycled from the starter kit. 
Now when it comes time to painting of these pieces, starting with the model staves, the stave detailing is actually very basic. However, one thing that is easily done to enhance, not just the King Tiger, but this is also true for the Tiger ones as well, is that on these German vehicles, the pieces were comprised of two type of fittings. The center sections would be wooden poles, and on the ends, we have brass fittings. Now, the brass fittings are very basically rendered on the molded in pieces. However, to really enhance them to make them pop, again, has to do with the paintwork. For the center sections, you would paint them as if they were made out of wood, and for the fittings, a simple swipe of brass paint is all that's needed to really make them pop. As you can see here, on the ones found on the left hand side of the vehicle, they really are something that catches the eye and greatly helps and improves the look as of, again opposed to just leaving them either painted black or improperly painted as being represented in all wood. This is true for the staves found on the opposite side as well. From the tools now takes the final bit of detailing which is the corner mounted breather valve. Now if I'm not mistaken I believe that the breather valve is for the tank's fuel system and is not just found on the Yag Tiger but also the King Tiger and the Panther series as well. Now the Toro molded in components are actually pretty decent. They would include the valve, the tube, and a small little bracket that we have here which would anchor it down on the real vehicle. However the Toro tooling stops short. On the real vehicle the tube would emerge from the side portion here of the hull and bend down like the way you see it on this model. To fabricate this little missing detailing it was very quickly done. Just a small little piece of floor wire that has the same diameter as the molded in tube that we have here was bent, trimmed, and just mounted in place. This completes this bit of detailing and again improves the look of the model. From the tank's detailing now takes us to the paint and the markings. Now this model here is not based on any real Yag Tiger which saw service during World War II and is completely fictional. The model's camouflage pattern is based off of a real late war camouflage pattern which is known as the bubble or the octopus scheme. And this pattern was found on a King Tiger at the end of the war in 1945. However, the picture was taken in black and white, and to this day, people have been debating and arguing what the actual colors of this vehicle were. Now, the octopus scheme is a spin-off of the German ambush pattern, where we have blotches that are added to the model's base coat, and the color that's utilized for the blotches are added in the lighter colored areas, only unlike a ambush scheme where there are dots or feathers, on the octopus, there are these bubbles that we have here. It's a very unique color scheme and works extremely well for very late war German vehicles. The Yag Tiger fits into that section which is why I utilized it on this build. Now if you notice the wheels are painted differently from the remainder of the vehicle. Instead of painting the wheels with either their Dunkel Gelb or their Dunkel Brun, I went ahead and left them which would have been their original primer gray coloring. I wanted to simulate a little bit of a last ditch type feel of this model and by leaving the wheels in their gray color definitely achieves this. Now if you notice the wheels are not monotone in that they are both the stems and the wheels are painted with their primer. This would have been a little bit on the boring end so what I did was to help make it pop further the hubcaps on all the wheels are painted with the Dunkel Gelb. Keep in mind on the real King Tiger series the wheels are bolted to these center stems which would make the pieces be in different colors, definitely something that you would see. Now, just like with the row wheels, I went ahead and applied the exact same procedure to the model's main gun barrel. This is not something that was uncommon with German tanks of the period. Very often, a main gun would be damaged and a new unit would be fitted, many times would be left in the gray state. Now looking at the end of the barrel, you'll notice a small little sleeve painted in Dunkel Gelb. The reason why this is here is that the version of the Yag Tiger, which was made by Toro, represents the versions that have a threaded barrel and a thread protector fitted. What's interesting about the Yag Tiger is that the gun was originally designed to utilize a muzzle brake, much like the ones found on the other German tanks of the period. However, for one reason or another, a muzzle device was never really designed nor was one ever fitted to any of the vehicles.
All the vehicles which had the threaded barrel had a thread protector sleeve fastened in place. I believe this system was eventually dropped to speed up construction because several other Yag Tigers I've seen, the threat protector is not present and the barrel is one continuous piece all the way to the end. Now because the threat protector is not integrally part of the main barrel, I went ahead and painted it differently just to make it stand out from the rest of the unit. This is a common trick that I do on these builds that have these mixed match color barrels. Now, like I said before, the markings are totally fictional and are not based on any real vehicle. The numbers and the crosses are both scrounged from my spare decal bin and were just mounted to this model in a location where they're typically found on these Yag Tigers. I believe the markings for the numbers are from a Tamiya 125th scale Tiger 1, while the crosses are from a Dragon 135th scale mouse, if memory serves. Either way, they went on without any problems and lacquered into the finish to the way you see it here. Well, that was most certainly a mouthful. And with that, that wraps up this part two of this three-part series on this 116 scale radio-controlled German Jag Tiger. The third and final chapter of this model should be posted shortly after this video drops. And there, I'll focus on the RC aspect of this build and take the model out on its paces. If you like this video and are looking forward to the third and final installment, be sure to subscribe to the ECA channel. There you'll get notifications of when the next video gets posted, as well as the other videos that frequently get posted on this channel. In addition to that, don't forget to like us on Facebook, where there are more photographs of this particular build that have been posted, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on the ECA channel in the past. In addition to that, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com, where there are more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching, and I'll be sure to see you in part three.